Hello, everybody. My name is Elliot Ruga. I'm with the New Jersey Highlands Coalition, and we're very pleased to pre present today Creating Met Meadows with Jared Rosenbaum. Um, New Jersey Highlands Coalition advocates for the protection of the natural and cultural resources of the New Jersey Highlands. And um, what Jared is presenting tonight is very, very much in light of. Uh, where we are as far as um, protecting the natural world. Um, before we get started with Jared, we are partnering tonight with uh, Muskinetcong Watershed Association and uh, Kyle Richter is here with us to represent uh, Muskinetcong Watershed Association. Why don't you say a few words about the association, Kyle? Thanks, Elliot. Um, my name is Kyle Richter, and I'm the Watershed Programs Coordinator at the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association. We're a nonprofit dedicated to protecting and preserving the Muskinet Kong River and its surrounding watershed, including its natural and cultural resources. Um, and we're excited to partner on this talk with New Jersey Highlands Coalition and Wild Ridge Plants. Um, we're big advocates of increasing um, meadows throughout the watershed and hopefully in the near future are going to be starting a new initiative called push back the lawn where we're going to be encouraging um, watershed residents to reduce their lawn and create more meadows and increase riparian buffers so more on that to come later but we're excited to to co-host this event thanks for having us um, we're also um, partnering with uh, the Sourlands Conservancy and um, with the Lepatcon Le Creek Initiative um, but they're, they're with us in spirit tonight. Um, a little bit about the format, Jared, Jared will give his presentation and um, there is uh, the chat opportunity or the Q&A button uh, you can see where you can pose your questions. Wait to the end, because uh, we're not gonna interrupt Jared's um, presentation with questions. We'll wait until the end and we'll have plenty of time just uh, write your questions and we'll take them. Uh, we may combine a few if they're similar, but uh, we really like to hear uh, what your questions are that are um, uh, that you're curious about based on what you hear from Jared. So uh, we're really happy to have Jared with us. We've done some work with Jared in the past. Uh, Jared is a botanist, uh, a native plant grower, um, and an ecological restoration practitioner he is a founding partner at Wildridge, Wildridge Plants, a business that grows local ecotype native plants using sustainable practices. He performs botanical surveys and provides ecological restoration planning services. Jared has extensive experience in stewardship and monitoring of nat natural communities. He is known as an educator in plant ecology ecological restoration, and the cultural uses of wild plant foods and medicines. Jared is the author of two books on native plants, including the children's book, The, Pu the Puddle Garden, and he maintains an active blog and podcast at wildplantculture.com. He's a certified ecological restoration practitioner by the Society for Ecological Restoration. So very pleased to uh, hand it over to Jared. Thanks, Elliot. Does that mean I'm on? It looks like it's a green band around my, well, there was a green band around my face for a second there. Everybody hear me loud and clear? I guess so. So I'm Jared Rosenbaum speaking to you live from the studios here at Wild Ridge Plants also known as the most uncluttered room in a house. So hope you'll excuse the background. We're doing a little demolition through the door there. You might see it. It's hot and sweaty in here. And luckily soon you'll be seeing my presentation and not me. Last night was one of those hot, still muggy nights. And then you turn on the fan and it's blowing on you and then it's too cold. You keep on waking up through the night, oscillating between the two extremes. So. <laughs> I'm real sharp right now. For a little bit of inspiration, I went up to our meadow before doing this talk, figuring I could find some kind of stimulant or stimulation or inspiration up there. 
I chewed on some wild bergamot leaves. They're nice and spicy. And I looked around seven years ago, our meadow was a cornfield just before we moved in, conventional corn. It was in a cover crop of winter rye when we started, um, basically started in in the spring six years ago. It had gone from a complete monocrop to what it is now. We got to see it through every stage. So we saw the annual weed stage. We saw the biennial weed stage. We saw the perennial weed stage, but also the native plants coming in stage, then the more and more native plants, then the native plants pushing everything else out of the way stage. And now it's sort of in that surprise stage where I go up there and I'm like, how did this plant get here? Or, whoa, you got big. So I was walking up there looking at the black-eyed Susans, the wild bergamots are about to bloom, the yarrow is blooming, which reminds me that I have to make a tincture of the flower tops sometime soon. And, you know, I hate to employ a consumerist metaphor here, but it's almost like having your own store where there's something new in stock all the time and it's all free and you can just walk around and go, wow, look at this. How did this get here? Oh, look at you. Oh, you're so healthy and happy now. And the swaths of color just change through the season. You get different guilds of pollinators. It goes through the yellow phase and the purple phase and the white phase. And I think as many of us are thinking about transitioning from classical gardening to something that looks a little bit more like ecological restoration, something that we can employ at a larger scale than maybe that small bed in front of the house or that you know small flower garden, a meadow is a really great place to start because once you get a meadow going, if you do the um, types of maintenance that I'll be discussing today, you set this system into motion that then moves itself. The plants expand, they do their work for you. And it's not, as, it's not like walking into a garden and be like, oh, I see that plant where I planted it. I feel so satisfied. Oh, there's another plant where I planted it. This is most excellent. You walk out into the meadow and you're really part of this dynamic entity that you're a part of too because you may have started it. You may supply some of the necessary maintenance to, to keep it a meadow. So what we're gonna be doing today is talking about meadow ecology and then talking about meadow creation. And without further ado, unless I get any signals that you aren't hearing me or something else is malfunctioning, it's my first webinar, I'm gonna switch over to our slideshow. Welcome to Creating Meadows. By dint of our frequent rainfall, fertile soils, temperate climate, we live in an area that a mentor and colleague of mine once dubbed the once in future forest in her book of the same name. If you let land go in New Jersey, it tends towards trees, sometimes rapidly, sometimes a little bit more slowly, but generally speaking, it will become forest. And much of the plant diversity in New Jersey are species that have evolved to live in the understory of those great big canopy oaks, birches, maples, beeches, hemlocks, and so on. They've evolved in those niches that are allowed under the trees where the tree roots may still dominate moisture cycling and where the shade of the trees is definitely a huge influence on the available light. I'm talking about species like spice bush and maple leaf viburnum and witch hazel on the shrub layer, Solomon seals and blood roots and black cohosh, Pennsylvania sedge, and many other herbaceous species in the ground layer. But today we're going to be talking about an entirely different guild of plants. My new favorite word is heliophytes, meaning those plants that are sun loving. And in many ways, all plants are sun loving but they've evolved to different gradients of sun, different intensity of sun. And today we're gonna to be talking about those plants that I saw when I walked up to my meadow. And despite the fact that it's really dry and gravelly up there, and we're in the beginnings of what feels like a drought and things on the edges are drooping, the little blue stem grass, 
Dewal Bergamot, those are all looking just as happy as can be basking in the ample sunlight, the dryness and the clearness. So heliophytes, sun-loving plants, it turns out that about a third of our flora are heliophytes, meadow plants. But if we live in the once and future forest, then where do these plants come from? Are they really native to New Jersey? What forces would have allowed them to persist or evolve in this place? And what forces might allow meadow species to persist now or into our future? Looking a little ways back in the past, on the order of several thousand years, Native Americans burned much of the Northeast for a variety of reasons, spanning the manipulation of plant communities to visibility, to defense, to hunting, to promotion of masting of oaks and hickories. And before the Native American presence, or at least before what is currently accepted as the initial dates for Native American presence, but very contested, at any rate, back in the Pleistocene, we had a great deal of megafauna here in North America, including in the Northeast, species like mastodons and mammoths and giant ground sloths and peccaries, musk oxes, bison, giant horses, giant beaver. And if you look at the ecology of some of the remaining megafauna that can be found in the African savanna, what some species like say elephants are really good at is grabbing little trees and pulling them out and eating them like broccoli. Or so I'm told, and we can imagine similar browsing habits for species like the mastodon or the mammoth. So what we think of as our deeply shaded primeval northeastern forest may or may not have been so in Native American times and before that or contemporaneously with that during the ice age when all these megafauna were present. Of course, we do still have a megafauna or maybe a mini fauna, a great habitat engineer called the beaver, capable of bringing down trees and creating meadowed areas, meadowed ponds, wetlands. Incredibly important habitat engineer in the past and hopefully in the future again. Where we see meadow flora now, other than, you know, that abandoned lot next to the dry cleaner or, uh, you know, the neighbor with the Chevy with the trumpet creeper growing over it who hasn't mowed their lawn for six months, is in areas of interesting and sometimes adverse geology or soils. So the picture up on the left, I'm going to assume it's your left. I'm not going to think too hard. It's kind of hot in here. Is of seaside goldenrod with some little blue stem behind it couple other cool seaside plants because that's Island Beach State Park. And as you might imagine, the extremely excessively drained soils there with the sands on the back dunes create habitats in which trees are not always the easy option in which blowdowns and salt sprays can be regular and which excessive drainage sometimes forces plants to be low and drought tolerant. The other image sort of rocky slope is up on the glades at Wachung Reservation. Here's an area of exposed basalt, exposed trap rock with extremely thin soils and an interesting high magnesium, high calcium geology. Some other places in the Northeast that we might see uh, extreme or adverse geologies limiting the growth of trees include the Alvar Barrens up in upstate New York where you have sort of a limestone pavement and also the Serpentine Barrens in southeastern Pennsylvania. Another place where trees are not necessarily wholly dominant is along shorelines, whether we're talking about ice scoured cobbles along the Delaware River, or just that area on the side bend of a brook where trees don't quite arch over the center and light can radiate in to the shoreline. So over on the left there, we have spotted joe pie weeds, some golden rods. And on the right, cardinal flower, royal fern, kind of a marshy edge, both in relatively full sun because they're on shorelines. But it's not just classically natural habitats that can host heliophytes or full sun plants. We also have areas kept open by people such as utility cuts, 
and roadsides that can and sometimes do host exceptional populations of meadow or full sun plant species. You know, I could say any number of snarky things about the ecology or the culture of this place, but lest some of you live in a house like this, I'll say this instead. I look at a spot like this, and when I put the snarky comments aside, I see a lot of potential. Think of all the full sun plants that could live in harmony with this big house here, which just right now is, I'd say, underrepresented in terms of plant species. But what if it looked more like this? What we're gonna talk about today is creating meadows, a variety of different methods whereby one might take that giant lawn or take that former conventional cornfield or maybe even that road margin or that island or whatever you got that's full sun and create a place that is diverse, beautiful, dynamic, ever-changing, full of wildlife, full of plant life, full of pollinators. Always something new in the store. I suppose I should start here. We're gonna be talking primarily about native plants. Classically native plants are defined as those species which occurred on North America before the Euro European invasion in 1492. But these are plants that have evolved through deep time with the climate and geology of our region. And they've evolved together with the soils that are derived from our characteristic geologies, as well as the wildlife species, which they depend on for soil structuring, for pollination services, for seed dispersal, and which in turn depend on them to convert energy from the sun into food for animals. They thrive together with these wild creatures, and that's why we focus on native plants in our meadow design. I wanna to talk to you about a couple of my favorite native plants that are heliophytes, that are meadow species that readily inhabit open sort of human influenced habitats, species that might be easy to plant or seed, species that exemplify those connections with pollinators and sometimes have deep human cultural connections as well. I gotta start with my favorite. Sorry, all other plants of the universe. Well, I have a lot of favorite plants. Depends which presentation you go to. This is wild bergamot. Some of you may know this spicy member of the mint family with its long pink or lavender tubular corollas. I'm not so great at color, so if you wanna dispute the pink thing, go ahead. I can't tell, is that blue or red, or pink? Anyhow, what matters is that this is an incredible pollinator uh, attractor. You can see this uh, fritillary over here, nectaring. You'll see a number of the large butterflies like fritillaries and monarchs and swallowtails relishing the tubular corollas of wild bergamot. You'll also see bumblebees, uh, hawkwing, clear moss, a hummingbird moss. This is a plant that if you brush by it or pluck it or smell it or have the audacity to chew some, you'll notice that it's hot spicy and drying, just like the habitat that it inhabits. This is a species that is most commonly found on gravelly meadows, well-drained areas, but you can also find wall bergamot down on clays in the Piedmont. This is a versatile species. It's tough, it's deer resistant, it seeds in extremely readily. It makes meadow restorations from seed look really good really quick. It's a good one to know about. Related to wild bergamot are the mountain mints. There's sort of a mountain mint for every scenario, which is why I listed four species down here. One of the cool things about mountain mints is unlike the long tubular corollas, 
that the flowers of wild bergamot exhibit, mountain mints have little flowers. They bloom in sequence around this flowering head. They bloom for a long time. And those little flowers, because they're not deep, are accessible to a great variety of pollinators. If you want to see the biodiversity of your area in terms of pollinators, hang out with a mountain mint. You'll see little sweat bees. You'll see little bee flies. You'll see little wasps. We're not supposed to talk about wasps in these. We always talk about um, birds and butterflies. But these are little wasps that keep the balance of ecology. And they're not exactly daunting to humans. There's a whole host of gleaming and emerald hues pollen hued pollinators that you'll see on the mountain mints. And just a real quick review here of the species. narrow leaf mountain mint, kind of short. Nice if you want a short plant, but short plants aren't always competitive where there's a lot of tall, rank plants. Virginia mountain mint is a lot like narrow leaf mountain mint, but it's a bit taller. It's common in both wet and dry meadows. broad leaf mountain mint I've seen less of in the wild in New Jersey. It has a little bit wider leaves which to me translates into bigger solar panels, a little bit more shade tolerant, a little bit more able to tolerate some dappled sun. And a hoary mountain mint you'll see up on thin soiled glades up in the highlands, like up on ridgelines where the glaciers scoured most of the soil off of the top of hills or all the soil off the top of hills and it has only slowly come back. Real good one for a dry, gravelly, specialized habitat. Partially, I include the Rubecchias because, like that wild bergamot, they seed in very readily into exposed soil. We often use Black Eyed Susan or recommend it when we're creating a meadow because it'll give that first or second year a little bit of shine. In fact, sometimes that first or second year can be really beautiful and you don't want it to go away. But this is a temporary species, short lived good for quick, cheerful color, and then fading through the years as a diverse guild of native plants takes its place. Tall cone flower is a little bit more specialized in its habitat requirements, it tends to grow in deep soils along riverbanks. I never thought goldfinches were camouflaged until I saw tall cone flower because it has these little seeds, sort of like sunflower seeds in that green head there. And you'll see them up there plucking it off and they're all gold and black. And they, they mix right in with the Rubecchias and also with our native Helianthus species with our sunflowers. Just a couple more on the cast of characters. Joe Pieweed. There's a couple species. The really big 12 foot tall charismatic one that's gonna scare your neighbors and go and march over to their lawn and tear it up and throw it down to the fiery depths of, oh, wait a minute, um, is Eutrochium fistulosum, hollow stem Joe pieweed. And this is an incredible butterfly magnet. I mean, that picture over there on the right, that was like half of the butterflies that were on that one flower head, but they got scared when, I, when well, actually Rachel walked over and took that picture, but I took the exact same picture as on the corner of our old house. This is a good substitute for what do they call it? Butterfly bush, kind of quasi-invasive thing with the purple sausage flowers. Really glorious. Uh, prefers a moist, rich soil. This is a good one for clays. This is not a deer-resistant species, unlike the mountain mint and the wild bergamot, but it's so big that if you can get a bunch of it started, sometimes if you've got a big enough meadow, it can keep pace and be a strong presence goldenrods. So as we talk about meadows today, I'm going to be talking a lot about creating your own meadow in a very active, involved way, seeding, or planting. And some of you may be thinking, can I just let my lawn go and stop mowing it? And will it turn into a native meadow? And that is a complex question that really depends on the site. If you're, well, at our old little moldy cottage that we used to live in, we were right across the driveway from about an acre of beautiful clay wet meadow. And when we stopped mowing our lawn, within a year or two, we had joe pie weeds and asters and all kinds of good stuff. We even had a native orchid. 
but if you're in the middle of suburbia and there's not a native meadow for you know a mile or two in any given direction there's not going to be a lot of local seed to disperse into your habitat and make it glorious and you're going to have to be more involved so yes it is possible to just let a meadow go our meadow has definitely gotten some seed drift from our nursery and some casual scatterings. But we're really curious just you know, what would show up here if we fenced two acres and just let this cornfield go. So one of the species we got a lot of was a variety of goldenrods. And there are a couple of meadow goldenrods, Solidago gigantea, Solidago altissima, Solidago canadensis. They're big, they're aggressive, they get around, they might be in that vacant lot next to the dry cleaners. And you probably don't have to plant them. I listed two, go two goldenrod species here that are a little bit smaller. That might be good candidates if you're planting a meadow or you're seeding one and you want to be sure there's some goldenrods in there because goldenrods bloom up to the end of the season, up through those first frosts. They support pollinators until it becomes too cold, basically, for pollinators to fly. They're important during the period of monarch migration. Uh, you've probably already heard that they don't cause, what is it, hay fever or whatever that was blamed on them. In fact, some herbalists use them as a medicine for allergic responses, but I won't go into that. The two species that I have here are gray goldenrod. This is a species of dry edges, so it's kind of nice and short. That's the picture. And early goldenrod solidago gentia always shocks me because I'm always walking around like, oh, spring is just over. Oh my God, goldenrods are blooming already. I, I don't know about you, but that's always a really disturbing event in my annual calendar. Oh no, we're in goldenrods already? Where did, what, 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 what happened? I didn't even get to enjoy the blood root. But anyway, Solidago gentia, nice early goldenrod, a little bit smaller, a little bit less aggressive maybe than those Canada goldenrod complex goldenrods that I mentioned earlier, tall, giant, and Canada goldenrod that are probably going to get there on their own. Asters. That New England aster in the photo with the goldenrods in the background, if that looks awesome to you, think about how that looks to a monarch butterfly that is on its way through New Jersey to Mexico. Enough said, right? A couple other asters in the list. All pretty much as beautiful. Milkweeds. There's been a lot of talk about milkweeds because of the concern over monarch butterflies. Of course, this is the host plant for monarch caterpillars. One of the reasons why we plant native species and start native meadows is because many of these plant species are hosts for their own lepidopteran species, for some type of native invertebrate that is dependent on that species or that genus or just a couple of native species for some critical part of its life cycle. So for monarchs, it's milkweeds. And I'm gonna run through these species real quick. Swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed's a really good one actually to plant if you have a garden and you just want a milkweed that's gonna kinda of hang out there and be hardy and be beautiful and be fragrant and attract monarchs and isn't gonna kinda of move in unexpected ways. Swamp milkweed is probably the fastest growing, most resilient sort of garden one other than you might be thinking common milkweed because common milkweed moves. Common milkweed is a species that you'll see a lot in former agricultural fields that feature tillage because when common milkweed's rhizomes get busted up, it spreads more common milkweed around. So you often see common milkweed scattered across a roadside or in an old field and it will move colonially in your garden too. But in a meadow, that's a great asset. It's a great pollinator plant and has some interesting edible qualities. Purple milkweed, a lot of people ask about purple milkweed. Purple milkweed is becoming uh, more and more rare in the Northeast. It's more of a specialist than swamp milkweed or common milkweed. I should add that swamp milkweed is in a meadow a best candidate in moist to wet habitat. Common milkweed kind of average. Purple milkweed kind of average, maybe even an edge, often on a rich geology like diabase or limestone. This is a specialist. This is a taprooted plant. This is a beautiful plant with an incredible fragrance. It's the bottom picture here. And it smells to me like, just like honey flowers. 
I don't know, it's intoxicating. It's not that easy to grow. Butterfly milkweed up top, a lot of people want to grow it. It's a staggeringly beautiful, bright orange plant. Also with a taproot, it likes gravelly, excessively drained soils. That's what the taproot is all about. It's going way down there to acquire necessary moisture and also to allow this plant to re-sprout after fire. So that taproot has perinating buds that if the plant is top killed by fire, along with ideally everything around it, butterfly milkweed quickly resprouts, flowers abundantly, sets lots of seed and revels because it's a fairly short plant and sometimes it needs the renewing effects of fire in order to persist in its chosen landscape. If it does, it can live for up to 75 years. I wanna to talk to you about graminoids. I've heard that polls are really uh, popular in webinars, like you pop up a little multiple choice question. But frankly, I had more than enough of multiple choice questions to fill my entire life in elementary, high school, and college. So I'm skipping that. I wish I could hear you hollering and laughing and screaming and snoring in the background. Hey, you, who's sleeping, wake up. Uh, graminoids, this is going to be really exciting. So a lot of people stop at the flowers and they look at grasses and grasses that kind of look like what happens to your lawn if you don't mow it, or at least to the, shall we say, uneducated eye. I think once you develop a taste for the native grasses, they really evoke the prairie like nothing else. So that Indian grass in the top left that can grow up to six feet tall. That's no outsized lawn grass with these beautiful golden seed heads, these yellow dangling anthers, and the little blue stem over there on the right. Again, assuming this is your right too. Otherwise, all the words would be backwards. Um, that'd be pretty funny. Turns this beautiful coppery, tawny, bronze colors in the fall. And one of the things that both of these grasses offer is architecture. So maybe from a landscape designer's perspective, they're a vertical element. But from that big, tall, showy wildflower's perspective, they're more than just a design element. They are liter literally silica-rich, upright stems that help hold adjacent big, showy wildflowers up when, oh, wow, look, my chow pie weed is about to bloom. It looks awesome. Oh, no, there's a big, heavy rain, and now there's a wind, and my chow pie weed is flattened. So I highly recommend the inclusion of warm season grasses. Well, of native grasses. I want to talk to you a tiny bit about warm season grasses. You may have heard this term bandied about. You may have heard of C4 photosynthesis. This is an incredibly important adaptation. Well, you know what? Let's stay looking at the pretty picture. About 25, 30 million years ago, Earth's climate was hot and dry. You saw the rise of grasslands globally and the rise of this new uh, mechanism for photosynthesis that allowed more pure carbon into the plant's stomates instead of a mix of carbon dioxide and oxygen, which is inefficient. In other words, on hot, dry days, warm season grasses can still photosynthesize without worrying as much about losing moisture through opening their pores. This makes them very efficient. It makes them very productive. Even though they only account for something like 5% of the world's flora, they may account for something like 20% of the world's photosynthetic productivity. And that translates to carbon sequestration as well. So one of the things that I find encouraging about carbon, carbon flux, global warming, and so on, is that if you look at it, the amount of carbon that's in our soils and stored in plant and animal life really dwarfs that found in the atmosphere. The problem is we've been taking a lot of plants and in the form of gases, if you will, putting them in the atmosphere. And what we really be need, need to be doing is taking gases and turning them into plants. So an intact grassland can sequester two to five tons of carbon per year on every acre. Another study expressed that a properly managed grassland can produce about three tons of fixed carbon per acre per year. And if you look over at that picture, I'm sorry, I should have credited that. That's a really fantastic photograph. I think that fellow was photographing the roots of 
associations of prairie plants. So you see some prairie grasses in there, and you also see some tall forbs or wildflowers. I'm thinking I'm seeing some kind of native thistle in there. The thing that's incredible about the grassroots is how deep they go, and also their cycle of dying back. So they die back and regenerate their root mass entirely every three years. And what that means for the soil is this incredible influx of structure and organic matter. This is what farmers are trying to do when they cover crop, but very short term. This is what happened in the prairies for the last five, eight, 10,000 years, building incredibly deep topsoils in the Midwest. This may be our fastest way to sequester carbon using a local plant association. And one of the other really cool things about these deep roots is look at that other quote, five-year-old planting of Panicum brigadum infiltrated more than seven and a half inches of rain an hour. Hey, say goodbye to flashy rivers and crazy floods if you've got switched grass instead of lawns all over New Jersey. And last but not least, an underknown group of native plants called the sedges. These are also graminoids, so they're grass-like plants. Certainly to most eyes, they look like grasses. They've got those thin leaf blades, upright structure, and not a showy, colorful flower. Although some of them, like this squero sedge here, I wish it was a little bit more focused picture. They kind of look like medieval weapons. They have um, beaks on their perigenia that radiate out at all angles. They're actually pretty awesome looking. And this top one, it's fringe sedge, which is, has fringes on it, like, uh, you know, the fringe on Ozzy Osbourne's shirts when he lifts out his arms in the middle of a Black Sabbath song. Uh, so I listed a couple of sedges here. One thing you might notice about these is these are largely wetland species. We do have a number, a great number of woodland sedges as, all, as well that specialize in upland habitats, but many of our full sun to part sun sedges are large wetland species like fringe sedge, and squero sedge, and the other sedges that I have listed here. We grow some sedge species in the nursery, and one of the reasons that I find them so compelling is we start our seeds in these 10 by 20 nursery flats, 10 inches by 20 inches. And if we let the sedges go for a couple of years and then try to pop them out, if you pop them out of that 10 by 20 by, you know, inch or two tall flat, you could basically flip the sedge mat over and use it as a welcome mat because their thin fibrous roots have knit together like a woven mat. It's incredible to see. And of course, that's what they do in soils. So some people talk about planting trees for erosion control or shrubs, and that's great. I got nothing against trees and shrubs. I love them. But if you really want to hold soils, you need to look at those deep-rooted grasses and those deep-rooted sedges. They're quick. They have fibrous root systems. They have that incredible turnover. They really build soils. And Potentially, they are the best way to convert our damaged, degraded, compacted, you know, um, biologically bereft soils into living and productive carbon sequestering soils once again. I'm going to take a break here and have a drink of water, but it's only enough of a break for you to, you know, stretch a little bit. Please don't go away. We're getting into the thick of it now. So, let's say you might have a little tiny bit of lawn, maybe, you know, just, just a, a tiny, tiny bit. And some days you might look at it and you'd be like, why do I have to mow this thing every week or two and use so much gasoline and pollute the atmosphere so much and waste so much of my time getting sunstroked? pushing this mower around or riding around on it or whatever. Anyway, I'm not going to try to put feelings into your head. What I do want to talk to you about is, let's say you wanted to get rid of a little bit of that lawn, or you had another habitat that maybe wasn't as diverse and productive as you like, and you'd like to work with it at scale and make it really happen. The first thing we're going to talk about is site preparation. So you're going to see a lot of stuff on the screen, kind of options how to do this, but I want to talk about what our goal is here before we get into the nitty gritty of methods. If we're seeding a meadow, 
And I will be talking a lot about seeding with occasional detours into planting because seeding is really what's economical at large scales, you know, over a couple thousand square feet or so. If you're doing an acre or a half acre or five acres, you're definitely thinking about seeding. And a lot of these things we're gonna be talking about do pertain even if you've planted a meadow like habitat, so please do stick with me. Our goal here is one, the elimination of competing non-native species, but also seed to soil contact. Let's say you are doing a seeding. Those seeds need to reach the soil in order to germinate in the soil. And there's a whole different way, bunch of ways that we can accomplish that. And I'm gonna kind of go through it. Depending on what tools you have available, what your ideological preferences are, what your aesthetic preferences are. You might choose one or more of these. Uh, mowing, yeah, you'll probably need to mow your site down before you do some of these other practices because if it is tall and full of rank weeds, you're gonna have a hard time getting anything else done. Tilling, um, some of you may have tractors, access to tillage equipment, plows, rototillers, other kinds of earth rippers, one of the things that you can do to create that blank slate that we want to start out with is use your tillage equipment. Some of you may not have an ideological aversion to herbicides. Some of you are probably shooting lightning bolts at me through the screen right now. So be it, I can't see you. I kind of wish I could. It's much more fun talking to a live audience, but you guys are great. Thanks for sticking with me, especially because we're about to talk about herbicide. So, our nursery is chemical free, buy a lot of organic food, pretty much entirely. But I understand and sometimes advocate the one or few time use of herbicide in order to create what I think will be something a lot better in the long run. This is totally one of those ends justify the means kind of scenarios. I do understand that there are threats to human health, threats to the watershed, threats to the ongoing soil health, and other kinds of problems with using poisons widespread on the landscape. But remember, we're not talking about chronic use of chemical poisons. We're talking about ideally a one-time application that is gonna to lead to something much better. And if you are dealing with truly difficult invasive weeds like mugwort or Chinese bush clover, or canary, reed canary grass, or Japanese knotweed. I mean, you might just want to give up, or you might want to consider your herbicide options. I'm not saying that even that would be easy. There's no easy answers here. I'm going to move on to smothering. Smothering you can do on small to medium scales. This is basically rolling out a big sheet of sometimes black, sometimes clear plastic, and uh, just cooking and drying out and irradiating with the sun the soil until everything's dead down there. And hey, you know, herbiciding is bad, but repeated tillage, smothering, they're not that pretty either. Either Sometimes we can use burning to our advantage to create that blank slate to get the thatch off, even after some of these other site prep methods. Uh, some people use grazing to get down low stubble. They may need to use that in concert with other methods. And some people might use scalping. Hey, you got a front end loader, you like to use it? Mm -hmm. You can pull that top layer of organic soil right off and seed directly into mineral soil. Now, those of you just hearing me talking about creating nice, deep organic soils with native grasses are probably wondering why I'm talking about removing topsoil. And um, I'm just gonna file this in a different category for now. Sometimes our highly limed, fertilized, uh, nitrogen deposited from the atmosphere soils are really hospitable to weeds. Think of all that excess nutrient and think about what weeds do. Sometimes if you remove some of that overly fertile topsoil, overly fertilized topsoil, you can actually get a really good native plant community because native plant communities oftentimes specialize in soils that don't have this kind of lax chemical availability of nutrient just gushing all over the place. 
you got a really nice meadow. In fact, any of you who've been to the great meadow at Duke Farms, this used to be like the big lawn in front of what was supposed to be the mansion or whatever that never, never got built. If you walk through there, there's like really nice low little blue stem and bone set and cardinal flower and all kinds of cool stuff in there. And then there are these two big humps next to the trail and they're covered with weeds like Canada thistle and pokeweed. And I don't remember what else was there, but they're just basically big hairy hills of weeds. And that's where they took the organic top, well, that's where they took the topsoil and piled it up and everything else got seeded into the mineral soil. So you can do some scalping on the serpentine barrens, which are one of those rare geological meadow habitats out in Pennsylvania. They've done some scalping to remove uh, deposition and get down to that characteristic, highly magnesium rich serpentine geology. Anyway, more than enough time on this slide. Moving right along. Uh, before you really get started, I'm not asking you to know every plant that's out there in your log, but two things that I would take into consideration. The first is, maybe it's not a lawn, maybe you're working with some kind of feral habitat and there might be really cool stuff in there already. So it would be nice to, you know, put a couple of pics up on Facebook of things in flower, or ask your local botanist, ha ha ha, or somebody who knows flowers in your neighborhood and just say, hey, what is this stuff? Because maybe you've got the building blocks already and you don't wanna go out there with your smothering, tilling, herbiciding, burning grazing tractor and turn it all into a blank slate. The other thing you wanna be aware of though, are perennial invasive plants. So those annuals and those biennials, those weeds that are kind of like garden weeds and doorstep weeds, they're not really a big deal for a meadow once you get past year one or two. But some of these perennial weeds that like exactly what the native plant likes, native plants like, but are really aggressive and have no real predators or pathogens on this continent, can turn your meadow project into a mess. Two that I'd like to ask you to get to know and recognize if you don't already are mugwort. Looks kind of like a chrysanthemum with fuzzy undersides and a very characteristic strong smell. I actually don't really know chrysanthemums that well, so I'll stick with mugwort. I know my wild plants better. Chinese bush clover, it's a rangy looking thing down at the bottom, and that is a beast. That'll all compete mugwort in a second. <sighs> we drive by this really cute little meadow down in Holland Township along 519. I think that's 519. I don't know the people there and I'm just not the kind of person who goes and like knocks on somebody's doors and like, hey, I'm your regional expert on meadows and I wanna let you know that you're irked. But they've got just a little bit of Chinese bush clover there. And they have this real cute little meadow. They mow it like twice a year just so it kind of stays low. And I'm just wincing because it's going to grow and grow. I don't know. In the poll, multiple choice question, what do you think I should do? Should I knock on their door and be like, hey, I don't have coronavirus, but I am an expert. And I'm going to tell you what to do. Or hope that they're watching this and maybe they'll recognize it. Anyways, moving along. Get to know your mugwort, your Chinese bush clover, ideally a couple other invasives, maybe your Canada thistle. And if you've got them to start out, you really should get them out and ideally as much as possible out of the seed bank or you're in for a long and frustrating ride, my friend. Seed mixes and plantings. So let's say you said, mm, Jaren, I don't wanna go with a seed mix. It's too complicated. I want instant impact. Can I just plant? plants in my meadow. And sure you can, but think of it this way. If you've got a couple thousand square feet and you're planting like plants on one or two foot centers, you might be talking about a thousand plants or 500 plants. And that can run into some serious dough pretty quickly. Although if you got it, come on down to Wild Ridge Plants. We've got a lot of cool meadow plants here. But today I'm gonna to talk about seed mixes and you get seed mixes at seed houses. There's a couple of good seed houses in our area. Ernst Conservation Seeds out in Pennsylvania and Pinelands Nursery down in South Jersey. I recommend them both because as you can see, if you squint on this seed list from Ernst Conservation Seeds, some of them that I've specced out there are PA ecotypes. As much as possible, I try to use local, eco, excuse me, local ecotypic seeds. So not only are we working with species that are indigenous to our area, 
that are native to New Jersey, maybe, maybe native to whatever part of New Jersey you might be in, or hello if you're from out of state but you're still down with the Highlands Coalition, good for you. But you know, Coastal Plain, Piedmont, Highlands, Ridge and Valley, you might know down to the definition of your ecological province what kind of plants would thrive the best. In addition to that, you don't necessarily want to be buying little blue stem from Montana or wild bergamot for that matter. I mean, you can, but a lot of our genetic diversity, a lot of our biodiversity is actually found at the varietal and subspecies level, which means preserving local varieties is of biodiversity value, but also, hey, how do you think a species from Montana or Georgia or whatever is gonna think about New Jersey's climate? I mean, maybe they'll do great. And there's some really good seed houses out in the upper Midwest, Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery, beautiful catalogs, beautiful plants. You can certainly get seed mixes from them. And I have, they've got good diversity there that's hard to find locally. But I would look at Ernst or Pinelands Nursery first, or if anybody else has any other recommendations of local uh, seed houses, I'm always curious. So you spec out your seeds, or you talk to somebody who knows, you pick out what you want, talk to those seed houses, get their recommendations for pounds per acre. Don't necessarily go with their prefab mixes, especially Ernst, they sometimes put some funky stuff in there, species that are rare in New Jersey, or I know they sell some non-native plants too. Nice to have a custom mix for your spot. Then, what you're gonna do is take all those seeds that came in bags, spread them out and mix them with something that's gonna water them down. I don't literally mean water here. I mean like cat litter or clay pellets, pro field, turf face, sand, but sand gets really heavy. The idea what we're aiming for here is any kind of a carrier that you can add mix with your seeds so that when you grab a big handful of them, you don't grab like a whole 5,000 mountain men seeds in one handful and use them all up because these seeds are expensive by the pound, which isn't necessarily a problem if you have a tiny seeded species like a Lobelia or a mountain mint. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck, but what you wanna avoid doing is tossing out a couple handfuls and then realizing that you still have three quarters of an acre to go. So you're gonna mix it, you'll wet it down a little bit, you'll divide it into buckets. Let me see if the next slide shows this. Uh, you can divide it into buckets. So see those six buckets over there on the left? You might wanna quad out or sext out, mm, never mind, your field into uh, different fractions and then create that many buckets. So even if you use up your first bucket really quick, you'll be better at your next sixth of a future meadow and you'll have a whole bucket to go there. And then you can kind of spread it around by hand, do a little dance on your bare soil, spreading your seeds around. You can have a dance party afterwards. Please invite me if you do. Everybody can stamp the seeds into the soil. That would be awesome. I've been advocating that for like 10 years and nobody has invited me to a dance party yet. <sighs> Alas, where was I? Um, seasonality. Seasonality must be associated with this slide. So we do a lot of our seeding in the fall and the early winter. There's a couple reasons for that. I'm gonna be real quick on it. Mainly, a lot of our seeds need to experience winter to germinate. They're not like tomato seeds where they're like, oh, a little water, a little warmth, boom, germinated. These are wild seeds. It doesn't serve them well evolutionarily to just germinate if there's a little warm spell and a little bit of water. So many of these are keyed in to various um, mechanisms that will allow them to experience winter first with, before germinating. So you'll get a night germination in the spring, possibly more diverse germination than if you just sowed all your seeds in the spring, although you can do that too. And the grasses do not require that winter conditioning and you may get a more grass heavy meadow if you seed in the spring. We'll leave it at that for now. Monitoring and maintenance. Yeah, this is a part that everybody leaves out, so please pay attention. You can monitor in many different ways, and it's always a temptation to leave it off altogether due to budget constraints, uh, lack of time, or you're just busy. 
But monitoring can be really easy. It can be taking a bunch of photos and putting them up on your blog or your Facebook or whatever, and just doing it from the same location every year. Or you could do something like the inventory assessment you see over there on the left using Floristic Quality Assessment and going and really learning what's out there and tracking them through the years and seeing the diversity, the quality, the conservatism of your species increasing as your meadow matures. What they say is the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, the third year it leaps. And that's pretty apt. You know, I don't love banding around cliches constantly, but that's a keeper because that first year, your meadow seeds are germinating. They're small. They may have annual and biannual weeds that are used to get in a jump on really quick that are concealing them. And they're just working on those nice tap roots and those nice long roots and poison themselves to have the high quality architecture to be there for the long haul. So the first year it sleeps. The second year, if you've got a lot of Monarda, Fistulosa, the wild bergamot, a lot of black eyed Susans, it might be really pretty already, but sometimes it's still creeping along. You're kind of looking like, I hope those plants I seeded in here have faith. The third year it leaps. This is often the truth. By the third year, those natives are well rooted. They're really going for it. They're starting to spread. They're starting to flower. They're starting to exert their muscle. This doesn't mean that your meadow necessarily will look like an unholy weed heap for two years. We're going to talk a little bit about maintenance. So first year maintenance. Your little seedlings are germinating, they're small, and there's all kinds of weeds from all over the world that have come and arrived in your location looking for some sun and some moisture and the lax availability of lots of nutrient and space to hurry up and flower and go to seed and spread some seeds so that they can get on to the next bare patch. And you, as a steward of your new meadow, you don't need to worry about that so much as you need to manage for it. So if those rank weeds get too tall, too fast and too shading, they may shade out your little meadow seedlings. So ideally you are cutting back those tall weeds to four, six, eight inches tall every time they get over a foot or two and it starts looking really rank in there. This is gonna help with your public relations, but it's also gonna help those little native seedlings down below that don't mind when you scalp your meadow down to six or eight inches tall. Some people will have a mower that you can raise the deck on. Some people will have a small enough area and a string trimmer that they can do this. Other people, myself included, will go and buy a scythe, which is like wielding a 28 inch long razor blade. It is awesome and it's quiet and it's not gassy or smelly. And uh, it's a pretty incredible tool. If you've ever been tempted, scythe supply up in Maine will create a custom scythe just for you. It can double as your Halloween costume. And some people speak of scything as this sort of meditative Aikido-like activity. I don't know about that, but it's pretty fucking cool. Oops, I curse, Siley, sorry, Highlands Coalition. Um, meadow management. Yeah, that's year one and year two. There's also long-term maintenance. Um, are we at long-term maintenance? Let's be at some pretty pictures instead. This is a meadow that I created at Great Road Farm down near Princeton. And I'm gonna show you a couple pictures. And actually this is a combination of planted and seeded. So this Joe Pie weed over here on the left, that's kind of a planted buffer right along the walking path. This great blue lobelia and bone set and so on back here. It's part of the seeded area, as is this New England aster with I think some, oh gosh, what's behind it? I don't know, super blurry. See some maybe grass leaf goldenrod. And then you got your bone set in here and mountain mints and so on. So um, let's talk about planting for a second. Even if you seed your meadow, some people will plant hot spots. So one of the things about planting is you can put exactly what plant you want in exactly the spot you want it. So if you're gonna have a little trail and a little bench and a little lookout, you might wanna have your Joe Pie weed there or your you know, butterfly milkweed or whatever your favorite species are right around that bench. You can create a little hot spot and you can still maintain your meadow around it, your seeded meadow in the way that I've just spoken of. 
What you probably don't want to do is plant and seed your whole meadow area because then you're not going to want to do that first year or two of mowing because you'll be mowing down your plantings. You get what I'm saying? This is where I usually rely on audience cues. See who's fallen asleep, who gets what I'm talking about, who's vibing with this, who's curious for more. The little bit of more that I'm going to say right now is just that um, after those first two years, very active management, you're going to want to move into maintenance mode where you're basically, uh, I see somebody raise their hand. I'm not sure if I can do anything about that, but oh, you disappeared. I think we're taking questions at the end. I wish we could take questions now because it would break things up, but um, hey, we're getting close to the end. Stick with me. So those first two years of maintenance, you're gonna to wanna to keep your meadow low so that your native plants can remain competitive with the weeds. After that, one of the things that you're trying to do with the meadow is basically keep woody plants out. So you don't want it to turn into the once in future forest right there in your meadow project. And if you keep cutting woody plants down to the winter, they're just like herbaceous plants, right? They're arising from their root system every year, putting on growth and disappearing back down to the ground with the help of your mower or scythe or whatever you got or your fire every winter. And the default time to do this is in the winter. There are other times to do meadow maintenance. I'm gonna clue you into a couple quick tips, tantalizing tips, just to get you started on this idea. Um, I do see some chat stuff coming down here. Let me see if I can access that. I hope this doesn't mess everything up. Ooh, look at this. Uh, okay, yeah, we're gonna do this at the end because I'm realizing that if I read this, so many good questions here, I'm never gonna get back on track. So stick with me, folks. Thanks for asking questions. All right, so um, if you have a problem with Japanese stiltgrass, Japanese stiltgrass is an annual species and it does have a weak point. It goes to seed and lays down this incredible thatch every fall. It goes to seed just after Labor Day. So if you cut it as it is going to seed, it's going to set a lot less seed and it's an annual. So it's not coming back next year from the root system. It needs that seed bank to come back from. And I also think it needs that thatch to suppress everything around it. So if you can mow your meadow around Labor Day, you can really decrease the com competitiveness of stillgrass while the other things are coming in. I've had as quick a turnover as one year of mowing stillgrass at Labor Day, and then next year it's all golden rods and asters. Of course, that wasn't a spot that had stillgrass already seed banking for the last 10 years, but it does work. If it's been seed banking for there for a while, you may need to do repeated Labor Day mows. Also, if you're working in a place where you have a lot of Eurasian cool season grasses, like the hay grasses, pasture grasses, orchard grass, Timothy, and so on, those all flower and go to seed and so on. Um, you know, pretty much now as well, actually, late spring, early summer, you can cut those back and your native warm season grasses and many of your wildflowers will just start getting going. So you can do like a May 15th mow and tilt the balance away from cool season species towards some of the warm season species. But the default is cutting in the winter after everything has flowered, everything's gone to seed. And there are more intricacies than that, but I'm gonna keep it brief because we're getting near the end here, folks. Yeah. Ah, there was my maintenance slide. I think we pretty much covered it. The one on the left there with the snow was to prompt me to remind you to talk about winter mowing. And the one there on the right, this is just a pretty picture. So early on tonight, we talked a little bit about meadow ecology, the ways in which Native Americans, Pleistocene era megafauna, a little bit of mini fauna, interesting geologies and soils, waterways, all create habitat for these heliophyte, these sun-loving, these beautiful native meadow, prairie, wildflowers. To me, I think a lot of the future of these species has to do with human disturbed habitats and how we handle the disturbance in our wake. In other words, these are species that readily take to disturbance. They don't need a 200 year old tulip tree or oak to be underneath in order to fit exactly that niche, that spring ephemeral wildflower niche, let's just say. They just need some sun and some soil and your love. And what I'd like to say here is that 
While the past of these species may have relied on all kinds of endemic disturbances of our continent, wind throws and floods and ice storms and lightning united fire and mastodons and so on, a lot of the future of these species is with you. Thank you very much. Good night. I'm Jared Rosenbaum from Wild Ridge Plants. Please do get in touch if you want to talk about plants. You may have guessed I like talking about plants. There's our website, wildridgeplants.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. Also, I have a blog and podcast where we go in deep on these species, on restoration methods. I'd love for you to check it out at wildplantculture.com or the Wild Plant Culture podcast. I want to thank the partners who supported this webinar tonight, and especially the Highlands Council, Zach, Elliot, thank you guys so much for hosting me tonight. It's much appreciated. Are, are you ready for some questions? Jared? I'm ready for questions. Do I have time for questions? Yes, yes, we do. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen. So everybody, so it's a little bit more personable here. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, first, I wanna say that uh, you are, you, you asked the uh, listeners, viewers, friends, what what you should do when you pass that uh, wonderful meadow where you start seeing some evidence of some aggressive um, uh, invasives, whether you should knock on the door or what. And by all means, the response was, uh, knock on that door, yes, knock. Get their street address and, and send them a postcard. Send a friendly note. Politely let them know. I would hope someone would let me know my hard work might be spoiled by an unknown inv invasive. So wow, I feel really guilty now. I've just been watching this thing for like three years. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know this coronavirus. I don't know. But that idea, of getting their address, send them a little note. I will make sure it's still there this year. Of course it is, and um, I'll try to do better, folks. Thanks for your encouragement. So some of the questions: Will, will I get wildflowers? if I disperse some wildflower seeds on a raked yard, or will nothing happen? By a raked yard, I take it to mean, um, you know, maybe there's some grass in there and some moss and some clover and what have you, but you've raked the leaves off and you've kind of taken some of the thatch off. Um, you know, our best case scenario remains a blank slate for seeding. Um, there's the least potential competitors to your native seed and the most potential seed to soil contact. However, there is a technique called, uh, sorry, something distracting just came up. Thanks a lot, Bill Evans. Um, uh, maybe it didn't come up on your screen. The, uh, gosh, I don't know exactly where I was, but there's a method called interseeding where you take an existing habitat that may have some integrity, even if it's just Eurasian cool season turf grasses, and you interseed desirable niche adapted native species in there, and then help push those species towards dominance in that area. So yeah, you could rake an area and seed some stuff in. Um, you're, uh, you're doing something interesting. And if you do that, I'd encourage you to share with the world your successes and your failures. I'd certainly love to know. Um, how can we limit and control ticks in our yard turned meadow? Well, 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 there are some products available. I'm not an expert on them, so I'm gonna leave it to you and um, Google to figure that out. Uh, some have said, that the overabundant deer population in New Jersey is a factor in the overabundance of ticks. I definitely think the overabundant deer population is a huge factor in the underabundance of native plant species and the under diversity of many of our native habitats. So if you want to advocate for deer management at a regional and state level, that would be a good place to start. Okay. Deer eat my planted goldenrod. Uh, can't remember variety. Are there varieties that deer don't browse? You know, there's so many deer now that they'll like eat the tires off your car. <laughs> um, I don't really know what to say. You know, goldenrod, if you go and smell goldenrod, it's full of terpenes. Like you could identify goldenrod as a genus just by that smell. It's kind of piney. Um, you can tell vegetative goldenrods from asters because of that smell that's supposed to be a deterrent to deer herbivory. And generally when deer aren't like, you know, an order of magnitude 
higher in population density than they ought to be, they shouldn't be eating your goldenrod. If they're eating your goldenrod, I've got one supposition, but mainly just a big blah, which is some of the woodland goldenrods are a little bit less deer resistant. I don't know if that's because they're in the shade, they're producing less terpenes, but I have noticed that wreath goldenrod, zigzag goldenrod, and so on do get browsed. But I can't advise you on like, oh, here is the least browsable goldenrod out there. Um, you know, we all have to grapple with this overabundance of deer issue because it's one of the primary things causing regional extinction of native plant species. And deer fencing, deer off, I do my whole roadside with a three gallon spray can of deer off concentrate and it's rebounding. That's outside the deer fence. It's really cool to see all the may apples and joe pies and black collage and stuff. So I think all of us have to, I guess, accept some responsibility for the overabundance of deer and do something about it to allow our plants to thrive. And if you are able to create a fenced area or a sprayed area, you are a really important refuge for native plants right now at a time when deer are so overabundant in the landscape. Um, on my first meadow, whoop, that question just disappeared. Um, Phew. <laughs> what are your thoughts on transition on transitioning municipal retention slash detention basins into wildflower meadows. What are the challenges, concerns, and or benefits of this practice? What are the best arguments to support and promote this idea locally if worthwhile? And this comes from one of our sponsors tonight, Juniper from the Lepacon Creek Initiative. Hey, Juniper. Um, this is a really good and very pertinent question. And there are areas of this that I can answer to and other areas that an expert in these type of structures would be a lot more knowledgeable than I am. Um, it breaks my heart when I see giant landscapes devoid of plants that could be so much more functional if they had plants there. However, the underlying philosophy behind these control structures is basically to treat water like garbage. And until we get past the mentality of thinking of garbage as basically trash or this undesirable byproduct of this thing that happens in the sky, we're not going to get away from these control structures that try to get water away from our landscapes as quickly as possible. What we need is really the exact opposite mentality. Instead of trying to speed water away from our houses and into the local sort of storm sewer or closest creek as quickly as possible. We need to figure out ways to infiltrate, to slow and spread water. And sure, converting these type of structures into structures that will infiltrate and slow water and build soils and be biologically diverse, that's near and dear to my heart. But the details of their engineered function right now and what happens when you convert that function and how they operate differently is a question better asked of somebody with more expertise in that. I can certainly help with what an appropriate seed mix might be or what's locally, you know, aesthetically pleasing or good for pollinators. But uh, I have worked on some projects doing botanical surveys of areas that have been converted from these kind of biologically bereft structures to diverse ones, and they're awesome. They're like instant native wetlands. They're so diverse and so beautiful, but um, I can only partially answer your question. Okay. Um, on my first meadow, I used Roundup. I hate it, but it works. On my second attempt, I used light collage and it didn't. I used light collage and it didn't. Grasses took over. Do you have any experience with organic alternatives? Well, the organic spray kind of stuff, as far as I know, just top kills. So it's not going to systemically kill the root system or something the way that a chemical toxin like uh, Roundup will. So, you know, I don't know what you meant to write by light collage. I think that's interesting. It sounds like it's some computer program from the early 90s. Um, but regardless, you know, smothering long term or smothering really hot with black plastic will actually kill the stuff there because every time it tries to re-sprout, I mean, it's just, it's deprived of water, it's overheated, um, but you know, you potentially have a big sheet of black plastic on your front yard for like a couple months. Your neighbors might think you're. Um, 
Do seeds on prepared beds need to be covered to prevent birds from eating seeds? That's a good question. So generally speaking, when we're seeding meadows, we're seeding quite large areas, and I'm not super concerned about birds eating the seeds, although some of the larger seeds they could really clean up on. Um, one of the nice things about seeding in the fall or the winter is you get those free sloth cycles and they'll actually work the seed into the ground. If you want to be sneaky vis-a-vis -vis the birds, you could, you could uh, sow your seeds right before a snow. Um, if you're doing a spring sowing or you're doing a relatively small area, you can definitely scatter um, straw, you know, something without seeds in it as a kind of cover to hold in. Some people will even hay a native meadow and then take that native meadow hay with the seeds and all the thatch of it and all of the kind of biology that's found in that thatch and put it on their site. It's kind of advanced level. I've never really done that. I've talked about it a lot, but you know, who's got hay baling equipment that's want to go big weed patch and hay up some Joe Pye weed. If you do, get in touch, we'll do it. So your seed dance party that you hope to get, someday get invited to, can, can that, Come on, you can't hurt a seed by dancing on it. Well, what you're aiming for there, well, you know, if you dance really hard, you might hurt that seed. But um, if you, you know, what we're looking at here is ways to work the seed into the ground. And yeah, you know, maybe if you're worried about the birds cleaning up on your seeds, what you, one thing to remember is that a lot of the seeds you'll be sowing are really, really small. And even though I have a lot of respect for juncos and white-throated sparrows and so on, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to find a cardinal flower seed or a mountain moon seed. Some of those larger grass seeds, though, that's good bird food. That's another reason, actually, to plant those native grasses. And even some of the big forbs, you'll see like juncos hanging off the end of your New York ironweed in the winter, picking the last remaining seeds off. So yeah, it's a concern, but um, I never heard of it like destroying a project. Uh, what's, the, what's the best way to get rid of mugwort? Um, mugwort's really tough. Uh, you're probably in for the long haul, whether you choose organic or chemical methods. There are some herbicides that are applied by, you know, certified knowledgeable applicators that are um, sort of specially formulated to be particularly good at mugwort control. I found that Roundup is not particularly good at mugwort control. You may need to do it multiple times. It may just not work. Hand pulling is definitely very frustrating because it leaves little bits of root in the ground and resprouts prolifically. Long-term smothering may work. Um, Mugwort's really a challenge. You can look for resources on the control of many of the most pernicious invasive species. Uh, look for the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team, NGIST. The New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team has really great resources related to control of invasive species. And they're really up to the minute in terms of different control, in different control methods, what works and what doesn't. What are your thoughts on tilling? more specifically tilling on an established wildflower garden or meadow? Um, you know, I'm not sure that I understand part two of the question. I think that if you tilled an area that already had desirable vegetation, you might very well be highly disturbing that vegetation, leaving an opening for, you know, weeds and so on. But I guess what some people may be thinking is, you know, can I just sort of surface scarify an area that already has some good plants and good, good seeds to soil contact? And I think you could do that. What you don't want to do is like a deep ripping there that will destroy whatever existing desirable species. I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure that I got every aspect of it. Okay. Is there any downside to clear plastic? Does clear plastic break down by UV light and I guess leach into the soil? I don't really know that the clear plastic is a serious threat in terms of short-term leaching into the soil. Um, in some ways, I think we all wish that plastic, plastic would break down. Um, one thing to be mindful of, if you lay out a perfect sheet of clear plastic and you've got deer and they've got sharp hooves and they walk across it, they might punch a bunch of holes in there. So just comes to mind as you're saying that. I think the reality of our 
modern lifestyle is that almost everything that we do has an environmental downside and that as you're considering anything from tillage to smothering to herbiciding to doing nothing, all of your actions or inactions have potential negative consequences. And it's sort of up to you to gauge um, you know, what you intuitively feel comfortable with, what your site will tolerate, and what you think is the best method there. And I can't really ultimately guide you in that regard, but all of these things have downsides, including you know, mowing that lawn year in and year out. We've got 45 million acres of lawn in the United States. Imagine, imagine if that was all met out. Imagine how staggeringly biodiverse and productive and carbon sequestering and just human life enhancing that would be and how kind of unconformist it would be. Anyway, then, then, next then question. Be, it might be the new conformity though. But anyway. Bring question. on the new conformity, folks. That's me and Elliot's new band, the new conformity. Do you have any advice on getting rid, rid of or controlling uh, bamboo and English ivy? I've cleared my lot from my meadow, but my neighbor loves their invasives. Um, that's really tough when you have a neighbor who has plants that spread into your yard. It's really a social and cultural issue as much as it is an ecological issue. And I'm going to pretend I just know about ecology right now and I don't know anything about human society or culture. Uh, to be less flip, you know, that's tough. I mean, it's really hard to tell somebody like what you're doing is having a negative impact on me. And how can we come to some place where you still can do what you want to do, but it's not adversely impacting me and without knowing the exact scenario. It's really hard to guide that. But it does bring to mind for me that in doing this kind of work, we're always ambassadors for native plants. We're always working both on our local ecology and also within the cultural frame. We're trying to convince people that this is a good idea. Um, it's hard when that instantly puts you in an adversarial relationship with your neighbor or with your township. Um, I really feel for people who are in those relationships because it is tough to go out every day and see that landscape or that person and be reminded of this stressor. Um, so for people who have already been enduring that with your native plantings, are, you know, hats off to you. And one of the things that helps culturally speaking with meadows is a lot of people will interpret it as not as orderly or familiar as a lawn or like a little, you know, garden bed. And it helps to put um, orderly boundaries on these things. So some people will like to mow around the edges, mow distinct trails, put a little white picket fence in front of it, whatever all those kind of social cultural cues that you think your neighbor will respond to and see, oh, this is intentional, well, this is on purpose, and this is keeping my uh, highly conservative conformist aesthetic proclivities in mind as you experiment with something that is, you know, obviously the wave of the future, but I'm not quite there yet. So um, navigating all of those cultural aspects to what we do in restoration is really important. Restorations can live or die based not on the success of the plant species, but on the cultural context that they find themselves in. And I think if you take the time to figure out the navigation, you can get there. By being thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. And reach out to all the rest of us. I mean, we're a community, and some people have had experience with how to navigate these issues. And it's really only by associating with each other as part of a community and ecology of people who are interested in this that we can make all of our mistakes that we need to make in learning how to do this very new thing, but also get better over time. So that goes back to that monitoring thing. Take photographs, make a blog, put it up on Facebook. You'll not only find that you're keeping a good record, but you may find that people are responding or understanding to what you're doing or offering helpful tips and hopefully not too much of that advicey stuff. Yeah. Um, can you smother with cardboard? Yes. So we do a lot of smothering with cardboard. We largely do it for garden beds. So what we're doing is, you know, putting cardboard or thick newspaper down that suppresses what's underneath it. And then you got to put something on top of that to hold down the newspaper or cardboard. First, you wet it down with a hose so it doesn't blow away because the wind always likes to start blowing whenever you put paper down on the ground. And then you put your 
weed free compost and or your wood chips or whatever on it. If you're real savvy, you can introduce some um, wine cap mushroom spawn in with your wood chips. So you have delicious edible mushrooms that are also converting your soil. And what's going to happen is your cardboard is going to break down, but not before it's smothered what's underneath it. And then you can plant into that. You could also seed into that. Um, certainly on a small scale, you could do that. And hey, if you have a big party and you got everybody out there with cardboard and newspaper and they bring their recycling buckets and then you cover it with something to hold it down um, and then you let it break down for a while, that's the kind of the key. If you're planting, you can cut right through the cardboard, a little divot and put your plant in there. If you're seeding in there, you can't just have like some wood chips on cardboard. You still need soil. But yes, with thinking through the process and what your desired end goals are, you can use cardboard as a smothering and we do it all the time here on our farm. Uh, can you recommend a good cover crop to combine with the seed? Yeah, yeah, you know, cover crops have a lot to do again with what your desired outcome are and what your seasonality is and what your site is. But I think I can be a little bit less generalizing and evasive than that. I really like working with oats one of the cool things about oats is it germinates in the cooler sides of the season. So if you're doing a fall seeding, you might put down some oats with it and oats frost kill. So you don't have to worry about, one of the things that people worry about with cover crops, actually, let me back up. I know I only got a couple minutes here, but cover crop is generally an inexpensive, easy to seed, easily germinating, often non-native species that's gonna temporarily be there holding the soil, giving it structure, perhaps um, preempting certain weed species until your desired plants really get going. I like working with oats because it doesn't persistently seed into the site and become a weed problem of its own, but I have worked with winter rye when it's an overwintering thing that I wanted some suppression the next year. Some people work with annual rye, but those can be persistent. I don't have much experience there. Um, I have prepped sites with big cover crops that then you till in, things like sedan grass and so on, but I want to return to oats if you're doing, if you're acting around the spring or the fall, which is generally when you'd be acting in a seeding, uh, I just, I really love oats. They're not expensive, they're beautiful, they're kind of cool medicinal plant. And they don't persist, they're not a pain in the butt. And I would highly recommend them as a cover crop. Okay. Do you need the seed mixture for a small urban garden? If your garden's really small, you should probably just take some of the plants we talked about consider some of the ecology and pollinators we talked about, and then make a microcosm of it using planted species. So seeding can be fun, but unpredictable. You don't know which plants are gonna come up where or when. If you've got an acre, that's really exciting because you're gonna see heterogeneity across your landscape. You're gonna see diversity. But if you're dealing with a, you know, an eight by 10 bed, put all those bergamots and joe pie weeds and Indian grasses and little blue stems and mountain mints, put them in from live plants, you're gonna have instant impact and you're working with a small space. You might as well have it be full right away. So um, we have one. Well, last question is. Last question. Because it's getting late. I think you're getting tired. You've done a great job. Um, will you share your slides with us so that we can post to our site um, for uh, participants to reference. So um, this is a question for you guys too, right? Because this webinar is going to be available on the Highlands Coalition site. Yes. Correct? So yes. I tend to put my slide presentations together with as little text as possible because when I do this live, I don't, I don't like reading off of my PowerPoint. I mean, nothing is, sorry, anybody who just does this, but nothing is more abysmally boring than seeing somebody up there reading text that I can read three times faster than them off of a screen. So I have really little, I have like prompts in the pictures. So I generally don't share my slides because I think they're without context. But what's really exciting is you're gonna be able to access this whole webinar directly from the Highlands Coalition. I'm gonna turn this back over to Elliot to describe how. Okay, well, Jared, thank you so much. That was quite um, um, a presentation. Uh, I got, some people have said this is the best webinar they've, they've seen yet of all the webinars they've had to endure during this uh, experience with COVID and re-figuring how to deal with presentations. So. Seriously, you know, 
Thanks everybody for sticking with me. I really wish this was live and in person. I miss you all. It would be so fun to be out there and actually like see more than two human beings at a time. It's getting pretty lonely out here. And uh, so I guess what I'm leading up to is stay in touch how you can. Send me an email or you know do some social media thing and uh, you know just give a holler. And if you got more questions, I'll do my best. And thanks again to the Highlands Coalition for everything you do, including these webinars. You bet. Maybe we can figure out when we get past this thing how we can all get together with an Oh, audience. yeah, and that dance party? I'm serious. One of you guys got to do that and invite the rest of us. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll help with the seating. We may, we may have to facilitate that for you, Jared. Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to thank um, our partners um, in this presentation, the Musconet Com Watershed Association. Thank you, Kyle, for joining us at the top of this, and Juniper with uh, a Lepacon Creek uh, Initiative and um, Sourlands Conservancy. We will be posting this to our um, soon to be launched YouTube channel so you can view it um, uh, at your leisure. Um, I want to thank everybody. And we are the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Please come to our website, njhighlandscoalition.org. Um, we advocate to protect uh, the natural and cultural resources of the Highlands. And you can help us out in doing that by becoming a member or considering uh, donating to us. We work very, very hard for your um, membership contributions. So thanks so much and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.